welcome you all to Trek Wars. The Nigavar class dreadnought serves as the flagship of the Klingon Chancellor, who is head of the Klingon High Council. This is the most powerful ship of the Klingon's arsenal, as well as the largest. The ship weighs approximately 4,310 metric tons. The ship is used for full-scale invasion, and the ship is rarely ever seen alone by itself. It typically is escorted with two Vorcha-class battleships, as well as two wings of Borels or Kavort, or similar ships. The ship is used as a command center for mobile fleets. The largest ship in the IKDF fleet, the Nigvar, represents the pinnacle of clean on design and makes for an impressive display of might. This ship is roughly comparable to the size of a Federation Starfleet Galaxy class. Following the dictate, more is better. The Klingon constructed her with the largest engines, the most powerful disruptors, and the best cloaking device, as well as the most powerful shields that the Klingon Empire could create. The size and number of offensive systems declare the Nigvar's intent. A large forward-mounted disruptor can four torpedo launchers, two forward, two aft, and numerous disruptor emplacements around the ship's hull make this ship a formidable opponent. This ship's targeting computers allow for the tracking of multiple targets, while individual disruptors can either be fired by the individual gunners or centralized through the tactical stations on the bridge. The Nigvar's main gun, the giant forward disruptor cannon, fires the ship's most devastating shots. And the Klingons have equipped their four torpedo launchers with the most with the most powerful and advanced torpedoes in their arsenal, plasma torpedoes, obtained from the Romulans. As with the Vorcha and the Katanga class, the Nigvar typically softens up an opponent with its main gun and torpedo barrages while closing in to optimal range for its disruptors. All right, so let's talk about its main weapon, this forward-facing disruptor cannon. So this disruptor cannon is the same heavy disruptor cannon seen in the Vorcha. This thing is incredibly powerful, and the reason why this is so important to the ship's offensive capabilities is because most Klingon disruptors, like, like the disruptor cannons aboard the Bird of Prey and the disruptors that we see on the D7s, these things are what I would refer to as short-range weaponry. So they're very powerful, but unfortunately they're short range. Now that doesn't happen with this heavy disruptor. This heavy disruptor can fire in the form of a bolt for absolute max damage, or if it needs to hit a target at long range, it can actually change it to a beam. And that long range beam is incredibly powerful and it can fire at a significant rate, which means that this ship can close the gap and take out a target before it even gets in a range. All right, so now that we know that, let's talk about how powerful this is and how it operates. So we've seen this weapon that's on a Vorcha class take out a Dominion bug ship in one shot. So we know at its highest potential, it's 520,000. So it can basically act like a shotgun and just blow the target up right there up close. But if it has to attack the target from far range, it can uh, change that to a beam, and the beam is 357,500. Now, it can fire the beam up to four times, so that means it's delivering 1,430,000 terawatts of damage to the enemy target. That's an extreme amount of damage. Now, to give you an idea, each shot that comes out in a beam format from the heavy clean on disruptor is 5.5 times stronger than a type x phaser seen on a galaxy class starship now it's real important to know that there's a lot of design aspects of the vorcha class that are the same with the nigvar so the vorcha class has that heavy spiral wave disruptor cannon in the front and it also has disruptors that are um, around the ship 
so it has 306 degree firing arcs. That is the same idea as the Nigbog, except for they added additional disruptors and they added more photon torpedo tubes. So it's real important that we understand that the reason that they did this is during the Klingon Civil War, one of the things that became evident is the very large Kavor ships were easily outmaneuvered by smaller ships with only forward facing weaponry. So it's real important to understand that all Klingon designs, when they were by themselves, they could be easily outflanked. But this scenario doesn't really matter to the Nigvar because the Nigvar has such powerful weapons in the front and it has an obscene amount of weapons all around the hull. So it's able to fight multiple enemies at once. And so on the run, the unique things, and I don't know if the Vorcha class cruiser is capable of targeting multiple ships like the Nigvar is or if that's just a Nigvar capabilities. I'm assuming that the Vorcha, it could do this as well, but it might be that these advanced targeting systems might only be aboard the Nigvar, which is very possible. So if the ship wasn't already overwhelmingly powerful, it has multi-shot torpedo launchers. So it can attack an enemy target with its two forward-facing torpedo tubes or its rear, and they can shoot multiple torpedoes. Now, if that's not enough firepower for you having two multi-shot torpedoes, we have the fact that once they get into range, they can use plasma torpedoes from the Romulans as well. So they can devastate you from far range, and then when you get up close, they can use those plasma torpedoes to absolutely tear you to pieces. Now this is an interesting fact. I had no idea that the Romulans and the Klingons were sharing torpedo technology. This was an interesting dynamic, but I guess it kind of makes sense because they knew the Romulans were involved with the civil war between the two houses. So I wonder if when they defeated the other house, if Gowron took the technology from the Romneans and then added it to his own fleet. Or this was given to them during the Dominion War. I'm not really sure because we see this ship before the Dominion War, so I find it unlikely that that was the case. Now, one thing we do know for sure is that this was Galron's flagship for his house, and that this ship was the most advanced ship that the Klingons had, and that there was only one originally created. So Galron had his own shipping yards create this ship for him, and for him alone. He did not allow any of the other great houses to use this ship in the beginning, because he wanted to use this as a symbol of of power for his house. His great house had the greatest Klingon weapon in history. Now there's also another reason for a ship of this size and being unique and then allowing only yourself to carry the ship is this also means that no other captain is going to be able to challenge this ship on a one-on-one. -on -one. So if they wanted to challenge Galron's ship for supremacy over the fleet, there's no way they can win because a Vorcha class cannot compete with the Negvar, not even close. So just to show you what I'm talking about, we'll do just a quick comparison. We can see the actual firepower, they're not that far off. But when it comes to shielding, the Negvar blows it away. When it comes to hull strength, blows it away. So the Negvar is easily twice the strength as a Vorcha class. So a Negvar is never going to lose a fight against a Vorcha even if the Vorcha surprised attacked it. All right, so let's talk about some of the weaponry on this ship. So we know it has disruptors that are all around the hull, so it can fire 360 degrees. No, its primary weapon is a forward-facing heavy disruptor. And we know that it's got also disruptors on the ends, which seem to be pretty powerful. And then it has two mega phasers on the bottom, which we haven't got to yet. And then we know that it carries four multi-shot torpedo tubes. So this ship is armed to the teeth and incredibly All dangerous. Right. So what does it look like exactly? Well, it has 20 disruptors, one heavy disruptor, four torpedo tubes, and two siege phasers. Now, the siege phasers are only seen on this one variant. So I don't believe that any of the future variants that we see actually carry the siege phaser. The siege phaser is something that was unique to Galron. And I would really make sense why they wouldn't use this. 
I'm sure that these weapons are probably astronomically expensive to put on a ship, not to mention somewhat unpractical, and I'm sure the added weight slows the ship down, and the power requirements for those weapons are probably enormous. All right, so let's take a look at the Deep Space Manual, and let's see what it says about the ship. So it says it was created on Kronos, um, factory base, type heavy carrier. Interesting. Has 2,500 plus flight crew and troops. Power plant, 2 MA warp systems, 4 impulse systems. Length, 682. Mass, 4,310 metric tons. And warp, 9.6. So it's a pretty fast ship. Armament says 20 ship mounted disruptors, one large, four disruptor, and four torpedo launchers. Interesting that when they talk about this variant, they don't talk about the siege phasers. And the reason for that is this ship actually was produced after the interaction with Deep Space Nine. They actually produced more of these ships. All right, so I want to show you some documentation showing you whether the, the other variants that were created to the Dominion War did not have the Seeds Phaser, and it was unique to Gowron's ship. So the Nigvars do not carry that standard. So this is what they are typically looking like. They do not have that bottom Siege Phasers. So as you can see this, this is coming directly from the Deep Space Nine manual. All right, and we also take a look at the episode from TNG, All Good Things. We also see that the future variant from the alternate universe does not carry those weapons as well. All right, so we're going to take a moment. We're we'll kind of look at some of the different weapons. We're going to see this future Enterprise go in and take out the Nigvar. So obviously the Nigvar at this point in time is in state of the art anymore so it's been on operation for quite a while but as you can see it's got the firing points from those tips and then you're going to see an internal disruptor right underneath the belly here and you're going to see that right now take a look at that so we can tell that this ship um, does seem to have lots of firing arcs it does seem to be able to fire much better and more efficient than ships we've seen before the nigvar operation system reflect clean and practicality the ship tractor beams are used to hold ships in operational space while individual weapons open fire on it as well as to tow prizes back to chronos at four thousand three hundred four million three hundred and ten thousand metric tons the nigvar requires multiple cloaking devices to generate an energy shield capable of surrounding the ship Though these devices are standard for that of a Klingon ship, the sensors, like those of other 24th century Klingon vessels, are below standard sets by most Starfleet vessels, but adequate to the job. Its operational systems, however, are quite impressive with multiple redundant relays diminishing the chance of a catastrophic loss of capabilities during battle. For a ship of its size, the Nigvar travels at a considerable speed. It is equal, or it is equipped with two antimatter warp, or two antimatter, two matter antimatter warp drives to propose its considerable mass, and redundant impulse engines provide sufficient thrust in relevance to space. Both engine systems, like the operational systems on board, are built to be reliable and durable. Although it travels at a faster warp speed than the Burrell or Cavewort, it is diminished by the fact that this ship maneuvers like a brick. So the Nigvar is a very slow moving ship at impulse speeds. It can move, but its maneuverability is poor. So this is why the ship has phasers that are you know, over the whole ship, 360 degrees. This is why the ship is designed to have phaser banks that can operate on their own, even when the command center is damaged, there's redundant technology keeping those weapon systems going. This ship is designed to enter a battlefield with a fleet and support that fleet. It's going to be fighting and shooting at everything around it. Now, the ship is not very effective when it comes to attacking fast-moving targets. It is designed to destroy large ships of its caliber, by using those siege phasers or that heavy disruptor. It also has those plasma torpedoes. So this ship is designed to take on large ships, 
head on head, but it's also designed to be able to defend itself appropriately in a large scale battle, being able to fire multiple targets at once and be able to engage ships at any direction in a massive battle like you see before you. So another prime example of this is when you see the USS Defiant get really close to the Enigvar from the alternate universe, you can see that that clean on poor sensors actually become a huge disadvantage because when you have a ship that's really, really small like the Defiant and has a lot of firepower that can maneuver around you and get around you and can become hard to target, it's a weakness that can be exploited by small attack craft against the Nigbar class battlecruiser. Now, getting that close is going to be really, really hard to do and that's the main reason why it has those support ships because in an actual combat situation most likely the birds of prey are going to come in to defend the Nigbar from something as small as that. They're maneuverable and they'll be able to destroy that small attack ship. But for the most part, the Nigbar is designed to destroy capital class starships as well as cruisers. It's not as efficient when it comes to small attack craft like raiders or destroyers, but it's still got so much weaponry and though it is not very maneuverable it's significant firepower shields and hull makes it have very high survivability now something i learned about this ship with i think is really interesting when i was looking at some of the uh, background behind this ship so doing some research i always had the idea that this is the sovereign for the clean on empire in reality it's not they are aware of this ship and they're aware of the technology and this ship was actually designed to take on warbirds and it was designed to take on galaxy class starships and come on top so the standard disruptor of one of these starships is half that of a federation type x phaser now it makes up for that lack of firepower by using that heavy disruptor in the front of the ship which is really powerful but if that weapon gets damaged, well, then you got half the firepower of Galaxy class. But if you take and you consider the amount of shielding this ship has, it's about twice that of a Galaxy class. And the hull is about twice that of the Galaxy class. And when you actually look at the ship, so this means this ship is very, very heavily armed. And when I say that, I mean that it has got a lot of armor. Because the ship in the weight class is actually weighs less than the Galaxy class, but it has twice the armor. So like I said, is this the Sovereign class for the Klanons? The answer is no. The ship is not. The ship doesn't come anywhere close to the firepower that the Sovereign has. And the Nigvar that we're looking at here doesn't have the Siege Phasers. If it did have the seeds phasers, you give it you know, a couple million more points. But even then, it's not going to be able to take on a Sovereign. The seeds phaser is an incredibly powerful weapon, and it would destroy a Galaxy-class starship. But it's not enough to take down a Sovereign. Sovereign shields could actually withstand a full barrage, and they can deliver an equally powerful barrage back and would wipe out the Nigvar. I'm not saying the Nivar is a weak ship. I'm just saying compared to the Federation's top-of-the-line starships, it doesn't really even compare. Now, this ship is superior than a Galaxy class. I will give it that. What does it go against? What does it really fall into? In my personal opinion, this ship is more equivalent to a Federation Akira class. And the reason I say that is the Akira class has got a lot of armor. Its armor is superior than that of the Nigvar. Its shield technology is not. The Nigvar has superior shields. It's got less advanced hull armor, but the Akira has more state-of-the-art armor. Now, if you look, they're more similar. Now, I would personally say the Nigvar would probably defeat the Akira, but it would be a very, very close fight. The Akira has an overwhelming amount of long-range torpedo, but if you're up close and in a combat situation, in a large-scale battle, the Akira will lose. If the Nigvar is attacking the ship from long range, the, all it has is two multi-shot torpedo tubes. Now, the Akira has far more than that, and their torpedoes are actually stronger. Now, 
on a scale of comparing quantum torpedoes to plasma torpedoes, I don't really know what the difference between the two is. I know that plasma torpedoes, I believe, were used on the Dominion weapons, and they're around 390,000. And quantum torpedoes are around 255,000. So there is a possibility that the torpedoes on the NIGVAR at close range would be slightly superior than the quantums. But those plasma torpedoes don't function well at long range, and that's a significant loss to the NIGVAR. That's where the Akira is going to shine. Those quantum torpedoes can be shot at long range, short range, it doesn't matter. Now, when I was telling you about the, the hull value, so if you were to take the hull value of our Volcha class cruiser, it's around 1,720,000 if you were to double it, right? So the Nigvar has got twice, more than twice the armor. And when we look at the size of the ship, based on the weight, based on the size, you can see that the Nigvar is a large ship. And it is a pretty girthy ship. And though it is twice that of a Galaxy class, you can see that the armor level on the ship is good, but it's not spectacular. Like it's, not, it's not like amazing like what we see on the Defiant or the Akira. It's just better than normal ships in its own weight class. Okay, so we're just kind of talking about some of the different variants just so we're aware. So the all good things, we know the smaller ones, the ones that attack Beverly's ship. When you do a comparative analysis of the two, you'll see that this ship is actually pretty small, and it's not much bigger than the Volca class cruiser. It's got a little bit more thickness, but it's a pretty small ship. So in the future, there is a sub-variant of this, and I'm going to call it the Class B. So the Class B variant is the replacement to the Volca class cruiser and is a superior ship in every way possible, but they dumbed it down and made it smaller. And so there's, there is a small variant of the Negbar class, which I refer to as the B-type. Now, there is a wrench to all my fun stats, and I want you guys to know that I'm aware of it, and I want you guys to know. So the battle scene we just watched isn't the Negbar from the Prime Universe. It's the Negbar from the Ultimate Universe, the Mirror Universe. That version ship is significantly larger and is half the size of a Romulan Warbird. The top is the standard Negvar. The bottom screen is the larger variant from the Mirror Universe, which is half the size of a Dominion battleship as far as length. So there's obviously a discrepancy with my numbers, and I want you guys to be aware that I know that. All right, so the other variants, the other Negvars that are out there during the Dominion War, because after the fight with the D Space Nine, Galron was so impressed with the ship he built more of them, but he did not add the siege phasers to the other variants. What are they doing? These ships are going to be defending prime territory, or they're going to be the flagship for fleet engagement. So they're going to move, work as a mobile command center. They will always have two cruisers with them. And they will have two wings of birds of prey at all times. These ships are too valuable, too big, and too expensive. And they're too much of an asset to lose. And the Klingons are not going to let the Dominion get to these ships without a fight. So these ships are only going to be used for the most important missions. So Galeran's people in Galeran's house are really good at building ships. They obviously built the Vulture-class cruiser. And they built the Nigvar-class cruiser. Now... The part that's really interesting about the Nigvar, my favorite part about the Nigvar, is the fact that it has siege phasers on it. So not only has this thing got 20 disruptors on it, four multi-shot torpedo tubes, one heavy disruptor, and then I know that they say it's just 20 disruptors, but those wing-mounted disruptors are probably actually disruptor cannons. I just want to throw that out there. But anyways, he said, you know what? This ship's badass. This ship is armed to the teeth. There's nothing like it out there. Let's put siege phasers on it. Now, what's honestly think, besides the fact it's awesome and it makes the ship really, really, really powerful, what would actually be the benefit of having siege phasers on a ship like this? All right, so obviously the first answer is this is going to be used for taking out planetary 
structures, shield generators, or its space stations. So this thing is obviously really good at that. If it had enough firepower to knock out the shields of Deep Space Nine, or at least two of the shield generators, that is enormous. That means that this ship is packing a serious amount of firepower to do that. So why would Gowron build a ship with so much weaponry? The reason, I think, is he was scared that there could be a possible invasion with the Romulans. And the Romulans are going to use warbirds. The Dideridex is a huge ship. It's a powerful ship. And it takes a lot to take one of those things down. They are true dreadnoughts. The... But the problem with the Warbird is the Warbird is slow and it is not maneuverable, just like the Nigvar. But here's the difference. The Nigvar's weapons are hitting for 975,000 terawatts of damage per shot. So at 975,000 at four shots, it's 3,900 terawatts of damage. That is astronomically high. This ship can one-shot a Romulan Warbird. This ship can one-shot even a Galaxy-class starship. This ship can even one-shot an Akira-class. This ship is very, very powerful. Now, you need something in the power levels of a Sovereign to even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Galron's Siege Phaser variant of the Nigbar class. This ship is really powerful. So... I believe that this was created and the idea was for them to use this ship and these siege phasers against slow-moving large targets like the Dideratrix Warbird. When the ship first constructed in Kronos Orbital Factory Base in 2369, the Klingon Empire had recently emerged from a civil war. Although the treacherous Duras family, the archetypes of the rebellion, was cast out in shame, the Empire's new Chancellor, Galron, felt the need for a ship more powerful than the Vortra-class cruiser. While the battleship used by previous Chancellors were, was impressive, Galron wanted a ship that demonstrated not only the might of the Klingon Empire, but his own formidable power. Klingon engineers designed the Negvar to compete with the, or even perhaps exceed, the Federation Galaxy class and the Gigantic Warbird of the Romulan Star Empire. Gowron's political aspirations, however, kept the Nigbar a class of only one, launched in 2371. So the brief history you just saw is an insert from the Star Trek role-playing game. So this is one of the official role-playing games, and this is the background for the Nigvar based on that game. So let's talk about what this means. So a lot of people underestimate how powerful a Romulan Disruptor actually is. Remember, a Romulan Disruptor per bolt is hitting for 175,500 terror points of damage. Now, they can fire at a highest volley we've seen is 12 shots. That's 2,106,000 thousand terawatts of damage one barrage so to give you an idea how overwhelming this is a standard clean on disruptor cannon is going to bring 520,000 so a Romulan disruptor is full barrage is literally four times the strength of a standard clean on weapon so in order to give you an understanding of what we're looking at, I want to give you guys a visual aid. So clean on heavy disruptors, clean on disruptors, and clean on siege weapons. So standard clean on disruptors are hitting for 520,000. A heavy disruptor is hitting for 1,430,000. Now those siege disruptors are hitting for 3,900,000. So that is enormous. Now the Romulan on average, is shooting a bolt of 175,500 uh, terawatts. Now, it can do this up to 12 times. It's, it gives it a really, really high number of 2,106,000. And that's its standard weapon. So we know that the Romulan Warbird is very dangerous. Now, if you're going to be fighting against something like that, what do you need? You need to be able to survive the first 
decloaking and virage and be able to return fire. And that's the idea of the Nigvar. So the Nigvar can, once it's once it gets attacked and you're engaged in actual ship-to-ship -ship battles, that ship can single out any Diderotix or any Romulan shit and wipe it out in one shot. So those siege phasers, in my opinion, were built to destroy warbirds. Because warbirds have they have good shields and they have good armor. But it's not great. The Nigvar shields are stronger, the Nigvar is got better is got around the same hull value, even though the ship is so much smaller. Because realistically, Romeo and Warbirds are not as well armored as you think because they're so huge. If you look compared to the mass to the armor level that the ship has, it's not that impressive. So you get past those shields and you can take this ship out pretty quickly. You know I may not like Chancellor Delron, but one thing we have to admit, and I think you might agree, he makes damn good ships. Thank you for watching Trek Wars. If you like this material, please subscribe and make a comment. And with that being said, victory is life.